Good evening folks, thanks for joining us. My name is Luke Gran. We're going to get started tonight on another Farminar by Practical Farmers of Iowa. If you could please just put in your uh, 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 name and email in the chat box there. Uh, we, will, we will get started uh, as well. There's two poll questions out for folks that are just joining us. Uh, place your uh, number of years experience with forages, grazing uh, in poll number 23 there. And then there's another poll question called Livestock on My Farm. Uh, which uh, details what kind of livestock you have on your farm so we can get a good feel for the folks in attendance and where people are at and what kind of uh, where they're coming from so to speak and uh, I do apologize for not putting goats on there goats are an important uh, livestock as well on the farm I just threw, threw together a couple options there just to get the conversation started but if you have goats too let us know in the chat box we're gonna switch screens real quick here uh, after everybody's got those polls completed Okay, we're going to switch switch screens now after everybody's participated in those polls. You can see there, Carl, where people are coming from. Kind of across the board, a lot of different livestock. Diversity is the name of the game. All right, let's switch over to the share screen now. Everybody still with us? Sorry about that visual switch. And let's begin. 42% of Iowa farmers say they will retire in the next five years, according to a December 2010 poll. That is a striking number and uh, really underscores the real need we have to ensure the success of the next generation. Practical Farmers of Iowa is a great organization that really cares about beginning farmers across the state, all different kinds of enterprises. That's why we're with you here tonight on this Farminar, bringing, bringing farmers together to share their knowledge so that others can be more successful. We are in our fourth Farminar in our Fall Farminar series, Pasture Seed Mixes for Success. A really great opportunity to share grazing knowledge uh, across the state from uh, consultants and beginners alike. Uh, folks are real interested in this topic and we're glad to bring it to you here tonight uh, with the support of the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program, a National uh, Food Institute and Agriculture uh, USDA program. There's our grant number there. We're really grateful for the three-year opportunity to bring this, uh, this technology to you tonight, as well as a host of other programming that we hope to share with you a little bit tonight. We're in our, about our 40th Farminar, if you believe it, 4-0, 40 Farminars since the fall of 2009. We have been doing these uh, typically on Tuesday nights, um, and uh, Tuesday nights, 7 o'clock, and we're really glad to have you with us here tonight. And we've uh, wanted to bring everybody up to speed, really, that uh, grazing is an important priority for Practical Farmers of Iowa, the membership of Practical Farmers of Iowa. It's an area that we've uh, really keyed into in the last five or six years uh, that uh, there's been a need for it, and our members have been asking for it. And so we've been uh, providing a host of grazing opportunities from pasture walks, uh, walking around with folks on, on pastures, to field days and farminars now. Uh, glad to have you with us here. Let me, and we'll go a little bit into detail about how this works in case you're new to the farm and ours. We'll start out with some introductions. So this is my brief introduction of Practical Farmers of Iowa from a staff member's perspective. And then we'll go into discussion led by Eric Madsen. Uh, visiting uh, with, him, with, him, with, with him, of course, is, is Carl Dalfeld, a uh, consultant grazing uh, pasture uh, expert. And then we'll conclude around 8.30. There will be time for questions, and we really encourage folks to use that chat box to put in the, the questions that uh, you have, and we'll be happy to, to answer those uh, this evening. How does that sound to you all? Let me know if you have questions about the, the setup. Uh, just put that question in the chat box for me, and I'll respond to you uh, automatically. Okay, so what is Practical Farmers of Iowa, you ask? An open, supportive, diverse organization. We, we aim to advance profitable, ecologically sound and community enhancing forms of agriculture, approaches to agriculture, and we do that by networking, letting farmers share their knowledge with other farmers. We want beginners to succeed. We want them to use our network to get, uh, get tips, maybe build some business relationships, and uh, share knowledge. If you join Practical Farmers of Iowa, you're, you're likely to save over $75 on the cost of attending events uh, if you were not a member. 
including a dis including significant discounts to our annual conference. So there's a real financial incentive to, to join Practical Farmers of Iowa as a member. Over uh, 750 families are members of Practical Farmers of Iowa, totaling up to 1,400 individuals around the state, with 100 outside of the state of Iowa. You can join today by following that link on the bottom of your screen. If you want to get in the network and talk face to face with folks, not just on Farminars, please join us at our Next Generation Retreat, the Beginning Farmer Retreat held December 8th and 9th in Boone, Iowa. It's a great opportunity to learn from farmers at an overnight uh, stay at a, at a Y camp where you can uh, talk with beginning farmers uh, into the late night hours and have some great uh, networking time. In addition to that, we've got our annual conference scheduled January 12th, 13th, and 14th. Uh, the 12th is a 101 Soils Day where you can learn from soils experts to really get your, uh, get your soils uh, knowledge honed and, ex and expanded even more. The 13th and 14th is our annual meeting, great opportunity to visit with folks. And you can register by the 31st of December and save money. So if you register by December 31st, you can save up to $40. So a great opportunity to register and we encourage you to do so soon. So let's begin. I want to start with Eric Madsen, who's a longtime PFI member. His family, uh, one of the founding members of PFI. And uh, then we'll go to Carl and uh, have great discussion with questions from the audience. Eric, I'll pull up your slides. And if you turn on your mic, we'll get going. Yep. Sounds good. Can everybody hear me? Yes, um, sir. As Luke said, um, Ben, my parents are Vic and Cindy Madsen. Um, I'm from a diversified crop and livestock farm in southwest Iowa, um, kind of located in the rolling hills about halfway between Omaha and Des Moines. Um, we raise organic uh, crops and livestock in deep bedded hoop systems and uh, beginning with a small cow-calf herd and which is kind of what we're starting to try to build up and what I'm kind of focusing some of my um, portion of contributing to the farm, I guess, with the cows and with the pasture. So if this slideshow comes up here. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'll start a little bit with just um, my story and then I'll transition to kind of how we do things on our farm. Um, not saying they're right by any means, um, just kind of how we're doing things. Um, just kind of as a starting point and feel free if anybody has any questions comments um, anything go ahead and ask them you know um, kind of just a round table discussion um, anyhow I graduated from Iowa State in 2007 um, I had a degree in Ag Studies with a minor in Ag Systems Technology um, I, after graduating I worked um, for a small organic seed company um, for two years and then in 2009 um, really missed the farm and the actual day-to-day -day operations with the farm so I returned in 2009 um, where as I mentioned before we grow um, organic crops, Nyman Ranch hogs and the small beef herd. Um, we began rotational grazing in 2008 um, we had just kind of one big pasture um, dad broke it into half and half um, we could see kind of then already with the benefits um, of not only more um, growth, more feed for the cattle, also better ca better feed. Um, and then this year we formed kind of a formal system w and with seven paddocks um, covering around 20 acres. And then also when I returned in 2009, um, there was the custom baler operators and haying operators in my age were kind of um, all aging and didn't really want to do some of the hang work so um, I began my own custom hang business. Um, our system I guess how we've what we've been using is a pasture blend blend from welter seed it's called grazers elite mix um, it contains as you can see the breakdown with 50 percent of the orchard grass 20% uh, fistolium, 20% ryegrass, 7% red clover and 3% white clover. Um, this blend is not by any means the best one, just one we found that seems to be work well. Um, we've got it, a couple neighbors use it's where we got the idea. Um, seems to do well in our soil types and we've been really happy with it. 
And Welter Seeds also has several different kind of pre-blended um, pasture mixes um, for people to, different people to choose from. Um, that's a picture kind of looking towards our hoop houses from the calf pasture. Um, that's part of the original pasture. Um, you can kind of see the one of the temporary fences um, kind of running across the middle from left to right. Um, that was kind of our informal fence. Um, we This year we installed um, high tensile fencing, um, electric fence as the divide fences. Um, we really like that system, which seems to be working really well. Um, there's again another picture of cattle on both sides of the kind of the previous um, simple fence um, with just T-posts and step-in posts and one hot wire. Um, I'm going to go back to that one slide real quick there. Um, you can kind of see on the left here um, how this this was probably about the day we moved them into the new segment of pasture here. Um, you can see on the left side where the calves are that that's eaten down a lot farther um, than on the right side um, with, with a little bit lusher grass. I believe this picture was taken in early spring, kind of with some real early growth um, where we try to rotate them fairly quickly and keep get them out of there before they eat it clear to the ground. Um, with our system, um, what we seem to have worked fairly well and is you want to start with a kind of a firm clean seed bed. Um, ideally we try to go behind bean, soybeans um, just because there's less residue to try to have to work in. Um, this picture was dad seed and pasture about two years ago. Obviously that was corn stalks but um, trying to get that residue worked down fairly so you get a fairly smooth um, firm seed bed. Most of the pasture mix legumes are wanting an eighth to a quarter inch of depth um, which sometimes can be hard to do with just the conventional regular drill. Um, some people use brilliant seeders and other types of machinery which probably is a little easier to get consistent shallow depth. Um, but in our case, we use what we have and have been getting along fairly well with it. Um, the blend that we use, uh, we target seed for 25 pounds to an acre. That's what Welter recommends and what we feel seems to be working um, to give us a nice, good, lush stand um, in the beginning and seems to give us a kind of a real nice coverage and even growth. We also use oats as a nurse crop. Um, and as with most of your pastures, probably they're going to be on some steeper ground. And I do feel that you need something else out there to kind of help get the ground covered in the early spring and get something growing. Um, so we, we've been using oats just kind of to help cover the ground and get the ground green um, as the ten typically slower growing um, forages start to come up in the spring their first year. With that oat crop, we would let, we generally try to take it off as oat hay in early July, which gets that top mat off and then allows the full sunlight to reach the young seedlings. I, we then don't really do much till mid-August, say, give it that, you know, six, four to six weeks, um, give it some decent growth. Um, we then go in and cut that first growth off. Um, a person could probably graze that, say mid-August, and if you wanted to, uh, we try to cut it just to, it seems like, the keep the hoof traffic off it in that first year. However, if a person had a dry, good, you know, good summer, dry summer, I think you could graze it without any problems at all. And I think you just really want to try to keep the animals off it during the wet season that first year until those um, new pasture seedlings get rooted down and get a good base developed. And the next, another system that we're kind of playing with is how to increase the uh, productivity and stands in existing, pa is existing pastures such as just the typical old brome uh, pasture. And what we've had pretty good luck with, we've done it for two years now, is just frost seeding red clover in early March and it does seem like it really does help to increase the stand 
and productivity of the pasture and we've had just used general just the typical uh, cardinal red clover is what we've been using uh, the one year in this past year we just used the cheap common red clover from the co-op and seemed to have real good luck with that taken with the frost seeding um, and then Luke I don't know if how you want to do this if you want to have people or if Carl wants to answer some of these questions or just kind of some food for thought here of what kind of I think that some good questions and challenges we're having I guess with what we've been doing um, you know what different blends people are using uh, you know again with the increasing the productivity of marginal ground it seems like in our area especially and typically overall I don't think the best ground gets put to pasture obviously and then sometimes we're working with some typical clay seepy side hills and some you know less than you know optimum ground I think and sometimes that may require some different pasture mixes or different management systems um, also again kind of tied into that is how do you improve existing pasture stands without starting over and the good typical challenge I guess of thistle control um, that always seems to be an issue in pastures and you know especially on the organic side of things that can really be challenge and if anybody has any good ideas on that you know feel free to discuss them or right shout let's, let me know if this, that's something yeah let's let's ahead, let's Luke. turn to uh let's turn to carl real quick um oh shoot looks like we just lost him again he's been having uh computer issues for some reason um so yeah maybe let's uh there's a question from the chat box about um what target animal for that pasture blend you were using Yep, and that you are correct. That is beef. Um, we raise low line beef, which are low line Angus. They're a smaller breed, um, and that is the goal for what we're using. They're um, they're a good breed for grass finishing. Finishing. We don't grass finish at this point, but that is a option we're looking into, and I think that blend will does seem to put on nice lots of lush high protein growth um, which seems to work well with our low line breed of cattle and I will say that the goats love thistles will they actually I see that comment there will they actually go out and eat the thistle or is that I guess I'm curious into that because that may be something a guy could throw a few of them out there if they actually will um, eat them that's something that I'm very that's that's a good point Did we get Carl back then, Luke? Yeah, I'm I'm on now. Yep. Okay. Can, can you hear um, me? Do you have? Or go ahead, Luke. Harry. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Is Luke on? Okay. Yeah, I don't know if we lost Luke now or. <laughs> what yep. we got going on Go ahead, I'm good okay um, I'm having a little bit of audio trouble here and and it uh, keeps keeps going out so I missed the last part there let's start with Carl's introduction and uh, just tell folks about where you're coming from, your experience and expertise area of uh, interest with grazing. Okay, can you hear me? Luke? Loud and clear. Sounds great. Okay. Um, hopefully we won't lose the audio again here. Uh, my history goes back to I've been in the seed business for about 25 years and um, spent the last 12 years or so with a uh, working with soils and forages um, and also we've been uh, rotational grazing and, and grass finishing beef here for a number of years uh, last two years we started up a smaller company so we can concentrate here in the upper Midwest but my background goes into soils uh, forages you know applications and uh, hopefully good Good uh, advice for rotational grazing, managed pastures. Th 
Thank you. And we can just go right to these uh, discussion topics. Um, uh, Eric did a great job introducing himself and his farm and was just talking about these four big areas that he sees. And I'll let you two uh, begin the discussion. Okay. Carl, I don't, if you saw the slide we're, with, we're using with the kind of the festoleum orchard grass uh, mix, is that, uh, what other blends are you seeing used? Um, what do you recommend or what, is, it, is that kind of a typical breakdown or what do you, I mean, what do you suggest um, for, say, I guess you could start with the, you know, like us with the beef cattle and then maybe another um, topic with the sheep and goat. Um, focus as right. well. Yeah, when I look at the um, blend there, it everything I'm going to talk about most of the time, and it you know we'll always say everything depends, but um, I really like to see a wide amount of diversity, as much diversity as we can get out there, and then depending on whether you're you're grazing uh, cow calf pairs or you're trying to grass finish. Uh, whether it's a dairy um, and sheep is going to indicate what we're going to utilize for, for pasture grasses. And I'd like to see a good mix of, of uh, uh, the different grass species. I do like the, the new soft tall fescues. I would like to see meadow fescue in there, perennial ryegrass, festoleum, orchard grass, uh, some of the bromes. And then in, on top of that have uh, chicory and plantain, along with red and white clover. And again, depending on your soil types and your species, is going to indicate what we would, you know, how we would tweak that. And then also your management practice, whether you're you're trying to uh, mob graze or if you are on a on a shorter rotation, and how know how much density you're going to have out on those pastures than what the soils can can uh, uh, withstand or hold up to. Okay, could you go into that a little bit deeper maybe and what would the difference be say if a person was mob grazing versus uh, just kind of rotate you know every four or five day rotation compared to like a oh a hundred percent um, you know where you kick them out and round them up in the fall. Uh, what would the differences be between those kind of three systems, or uh, what would the different targets be, I guess? Yeah, and some of that comes down to how long you're going to give a, a recovery period to as well, and how long the, if you're moving them every 12 hours or every day, um, and then you're going to give them a full recovery. If we have the, the diversity out there, um, if we have enough time for those plants to recover, then that's going to let us have have a little more diversity. And also, the wider the diversity of all the the uh, forage analysis that I've looked at over the years, the better the the quality. Um, when we get into the having uh, 81 different species, you know, on the on the farm, uh, we don't do as much selection. Uh, if you got the animal density, you're gonna, they're not going to select for just the perennial ryegrass or just the orchard grass. They're going to get a little bit of everything in every bite. Hope that if that makes sense. Whereas right, if we're coming back, right, right, and we get on to to uh, some of the dairies where it's only. Um, Eight to ten inches tall before they come back to it again. Then we better have compatible species, and that's going to limit the the amount of species that we can have out there. And that's where your your uh, perennial ryegrass, festoleums, meadow fescue.
Eric, are you on? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, what uh, uh, Carl just concluded about talking about those different uh, seed mixes? Wanted to check for understanding with you real quick. Yeah, I mean, I I understand what he's trying to get at. You know, comparing the you know the different you know what your main goal is. I think that's a good point um, to emphasize if you're going for that you know high protein finishing or if you're going for just overall volume or like he mentioned with the dairy where they kick them out and kick them back in again uh, with re fast recovery and uh, going in you know, going for less regrowth and high protein obviously a 30 day schedule Eric, are you there? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, it did it to me again. Okay. Now, uh, do you want to repeat what you had just talked about? Well, we were just, I guess I was just kind of re you know, what we had gotten into with, uh, you know, fi figuring out your what your goal is, uh, where you want to begin, uh, what type of system you use and what blend you're using, and I guess... I don't know. Another kind of I'll tie into this point too is it seems like what, and at least here in the late summer, it's hard to get much to grow besides the alfalfas and clovers. And Luke? I'm with you, Carl. Yeah, I think we want. Is Eric still there? No, I think we, we uh, lost him too. Um, <laughs> okay. He's back on now. Okay. okay. We'll go with it. I think Eric was uh, just talking about, um, was he just talking about grazing management as far as uh, what species and for a beginner where to start? Are you with us, Eric? Maybe we'll take a question from the chat box until uh, we've got Eric back on. Carl, do you want to answer one of those uh, from Ray or Will or Kathy? Yes. Uh, where do we want to go here? Uh, one of the questions from Will was, what is the feed nutrient value of volunteers like plantain and chicory? Um, we have done a fair amount of um, doing uh, relative forage quality testing on the plantain and chicory. And when I talk about relative forage quality, I'm not talking about uh, RFV, which is the relative feed value, which is just a, a uh, test of ADF and NDF. And the relative forage quality on those plants has been... Uh, up over 200 even when it's getting into we'll call it mid maturity when it's starting to get a little bit taller uh, but it plantain and chicory both pull up great amounts of uh, calcium and phosphorus uh, sulfur if it's in the soil uh, they they're just very well mineralized plants and they also have characteristics about them that that uh, uh, have medicinal value if you will, for the for the livestock. 
a little bit of that is kind of a uh, worm uh, worm load suppressant. And as far as what percent, uh, if I could have five five to uh, ten percent, but five percent would be a good. Sorry, folks. Looks like we lost Carl again. Uh, let's see here. And Eric, are you not on? Let's check with you first. Okay. I'm gonna, Eric. I'm gonna boot you, and we'll hope you join us if you can hear me. And uh, rejoin us. Um, okay. So we're gonna wait for our presenters to get back online here. Do apologize for this, folks. Hmm. There's Carl. Feel free to put those questions in the chat box so we can answer those when folks come back online. All right, let's try this again, fellas. Eric and Carl are back online. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Luke? I can. Okay, Eric? Yes, sir. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, I don't know, if is Eric on as well? Because I'm not picking him up. Yeah, I can't say. Let's maybe we'll go ahead and hopefully he'll yeah. join us when his in internet's there. Um, we might as well go to the uh, next one with the the triticale blends and peas in a rotation. Um, as grass finishers and and also just for the the sheer. Um, tonnage that we can and forage quality that we can get off of uh, some of these cool season annuals and warm season annuals. I like to incorporate um, something like triticale or forage oats in either the triticale planted in the fall or in the spring then along with the uh, uh, forage oats but also if we could have peas in there or even underseed it with uh, Italian ryegrass or something on that order. We can get a lot of high quality forage. Um, and then we can come in behind that with um, something like sedan grass or sorghum sedan grass, uh, even grazing corn, anything like that. And can actually put together a pretty good forage chain which will help extend actually our summer slump and also go in later into the fall uh, for uh, extending out the pasture into the fall. I hope that answered that, Kathy. Um, going down through the list, any other species that we might typically consider weeds? Um, I don't know if I could get up my, I have a, um, few slides that I'd put up, but on one of our pastures that actually had some native pasture in it, we we uh, counted about 51 different species, and in there some of those would be considered considered weeds. Um, there's little burnet, the chicory, um, actually comfrey. If it if an animal needs it, it would be a something that they would eat. 
um, when we look at the broad leaves, actually even lamb's quarter and, and pigweed are, are pretty good on nutritional value. The problem we run into is, is palatability uh, once it gets a little bigger and starts filling in the lignin. Sorry folks, looks like we lost our speaker again. It's likely due to a bandwidth overload uh, this time of night. So let's see if Eric's audio is back on. Um, and if not, let's use that chat box and keep questions flowing through that way. contact Luke, are you there? Yep, I hear you fine, Carl. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. She just keeps wanting to go offline here. Uh, I don't know how much everybody could hear uh, when I started talking about the... Uh, uh, trying to renovate a pasture uh, without a drill. The main thing we got to have is soil seed contact. Uh, and that might mean if we could run a disc over it, uh, broadcast it, run a disc over it, and then run a roller over it. But we got to have a nice seed firm bed up on top. Uh, if you look at the size of... Uh, clover seed or some of the grass seeds, they're very, very small. And if we don't have the good soil seed contact, we're going to lose our moisture and they will uh, get about an inch tall and then they'll uh, uh, dry out and desiccate out the little root system and they won't recover. Uh, with the price of seed, I want the best options that we can possibly get um, in, order to, in order to get good establishment. Uh, some people get by with frost seeding, but if you're going to frost seed, you can't have thatch. You would need uh, to have some soil showing. And then we got to do that early enough um, in the in the spring that the freezing and thawing action actually helps pull in the seed, makes the soil seed contacts to get it to get it to uh, germinate.
the uh, Kathy had the question on uh, grazing uh, July seeded blends that would not winter over. Uh, if we get into the warm season annuals, a lot of times we'll want to have those planted in in uh, June. But if we get into to uh, uh, July, uh, early July, we still have quite a few people that will plant sorghum sedan grass or sedan grass. They won't get three or four grazings out of it, but they might get one or two grazings out of it. Uh, another opportunity is is once we get into um, August and it starts cooling down, or first September, then we that's when we could come in with triticale and with moisture be able to have some fall grazing on that and let it carry over into the into the spring. Uh, Paul made the comment about the uh, mix for winter or early spring grazing. Uh, again, you know, if I can have some diversity and if some of that could overwinter, that would be good. And I would, I would mix them together, the oats, uh, rye, uh, I see the crimson clover. That may or may not overwinter for us and probably wouldn't overwinter for us north of Interstate 80. Instead, we could come in with uh, even uh, some inexpensive red clover. And once again, when we, when we talk about that diversity, I'm also looking at soil biology. I see Ray um, asking about the Japanese millet. Uh, I've planted it for an annual for quick grazing. Uh, some have used the the Japanese millet. Uh, we we actually use a uh, pearl millet. Pearl millet. Uh, other options are teff, and both of those you can really graze. Uh, Hard, they recover fast. Um, both of them need to be uh, fairly immature for palatability's sake. And then you would have a longer stretch uh, from planting to, to grazing with uh, sedan grass and sorghum sedan grass. Uh, sedan grass is actually um, quite palatable, especially if you get the, the BMR versions of it. And the recovery on it, I was really impressed with. But I have noticed with the millets and the, like I said, with the millet and the teff, that you need to, to uh, hammer those pretty hard.
Carl, if you can hear me, let's uh, let's move over to the discussion questions posted by Eric, and he's going to try to respond by. Oh, looks like we just lost Carl. Darn, um, folks. <laughs> sorry about all these these problems we're having tonight. It's just uh, maddening. I'm so sorry for this. Um, let's think about these discussion questions and see if we can help Eric uh, think about solutions. And Eric will join us on the chat box there and. Let's uh, try to use that chat box to, to have some, some good back and forth. Bloat. Yep, that's a great one. I hear you, Carl. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's my uh, internet keeps going in and out. Just looking, trying to keep up and, and go through the list without without uh, missing something here. The question Ray had on the uh, non-chemical musk thistle control. Um, I think a good answer to that is is your your pasture density. Uh, thistles tend to like open open soil, uh, tight soils. Uh, so running an airway uh, or a yeoman plow would be something that could uh, help loosen up the soil and then also make sure that we have the density of the stand so the sunlight doesn't hit the ground and, and re-generate. Uh, uh, I see somebody just put in the acetic acid to burn them down. Uh, another answer to that too is, is a sand shovel. That's what we always, that's what we always had to use. Um, if they're really thick, you're, I think actually uh, um, going out with a uh, mower, making sure that we get them before they they head out, and I know that they're going to head out, try to head out again. But again, keeping the the density of that pasture up helps keep them from uh, germinating. The I see some things uh, people are looking at. Uh, things to um, avoid bloat and I would agree agree with a lot of them or most of them um, one of the things and I don't know who all is is on here this evening but it, looking to see if uh, Tom German's on here but one time he told me actually to put a bar of soap in the water and it can be any any um, just hand soap that doesn't suds up a lot, so there are organic versions to that, and we always uh, put that into the water before we put them into a heavy uh, lagoon pasture, and then also talking with some um, organic valley uh, vets, uh, if we have imbalances in our forages with uh, 
if we have imbalances in the in the soil with magnesium and phosphorus and also calcium but also into the forages um, that is what is one of the things that helps cause bloat and if we can uh, take care of some of that that would that would help it I think Dan should should uh, type out the uh, homeopathy bloat remedy. Uh, we were we were always fortunate. We never had bloat caused by legumes, but we also did some some work on the uh, calcium phosphorus levels on the on the soil. The Luke put in there what is the calcium phosphorus levels do to reduce the bloating possibilities and that's something I picked up from the uh, like I said the organic valley uh, veterinarians and I don't completely understand it I've always always told that if your calcium phosphorus levels are in balance that uh, uh, you wouldn't have bloat and I've never been brave enough to tell anybody that if they balance the soils perfectly that they would never have bloat. It was never quite that brave. But when I was talking to um, the uh, vets, they also brought in magnesium. And if if our uh, calcium is at a, a higher level and our phosphorus is low and our magnesium is low, uh, that was when we could end up having uh, bloat issues. And some of the things that you can can do to uh, offset that would be actually either through the mineral or uh, uh, through the soils. The thing about the magnesium is, is if it's really high in our soils, we're not going to have probably have the uptake into the plant and that's where the calcium comes in.
one of the things that I did want to um, discuss and see what you guys, you know, everybody's thoughts are as well was uh, one of them was the tips for increasing the productivity on poor soils. And like Eric said earlier, a lot of our soils are uh, uh, that are in pasture are not our most productive soils. And I have come across that a fair amount where people will ask uh, what to do. And one of the first things I would do on some of these poor soils, you know, providing they're not uh, so steep that you can't even get a tractor or four-wheeler on them. Um, but the first thing I would do is soil test. And sometimes that requires us that we may have to end up uh, putting on some soil amendments. It's not something that you have to do every year. Uh, but we do need to have adequate levels of uh, not only phosphorus and and uh, calcium on the soils, but also potassium. And I don't know how many here were uh, dairy producers, but this would could even be said for grass finishing beef and uh, uh, cow calf pears, sheep, whatever. We are exporting nutrients through our livestock off the soils. We don't do it as quickly as we do with uh, dairy. But I've looked at a fair amount of uh, grazing uh, operations that are getting extremely low in in potassium and also phosphorus. So we may you know need some uh, soil amendments, but then also our grazing management and anything that we can do to uh, uh, build up our organic matter, which in turn helps on the soil biology and look at ideas to where we can uh, move some of the nutrients <laughs> when we can when we can uh, wherever we outwinter cattle we tend to accumulate the nutrients so uh, a lot of times we have enough nutrients that are just in uh, close to the barn or out by a windbreak uh, but if we could outwinter on some of these poor soils uh, do anything we can get uh, compost, uh, feedlot buildup, we could spread out on the poor pastures, that could be a good source of nutrients. Uh, I see Luke's on there with what happens when your soils are low in potassium and phosphorus. Uh, potassium is actually a nutrient that, that on the dairy side they say it's, it's not a good nutrient because uh, dry cows, if you feed them too much potassium, you end up with uh, milk fevers and other other issues at calving. Uh, but it also is is part of our yield and part of the structure of the plant, so that becomes uh, very very yield limiting. Um, with phosphorus, phosphorus is metabolizable energy. And without without phosphorus uptake into the plant, uh, we don't have the uh, the digestibility actually into the plant. And then when you look at phosphorus in a rumen, it's it is metabolizable energy. So we definitely want that in there for forage quality. But all those nutrients uh, help help to uh, increase not only our forage quality but also our yields. I was at a dairy farm in Wisconsin recently that that the soils were so low in potassium that uh, I don't know how many of you have seen uh, pastures where the grass is all yellow, uh, doesn't see, have it, seem to have any growth, but as soon as you uh, go by a urine spot or a cow pie, uh, you see you see taller, greener grass, and a lot of times that is a can be a potassium issue or a phosphorus issue. But I also don't want to, to uh, count out air. I think a lot of uh, pastures out here we need to be looking at should we run an airway or a yeoman plow. And a yeoman plow is kind of like a mini deep river or deep ripper uh, without doing damage up on top. 
And I think a uh, large part of our issues with grazing is is cows compact, sheep compact. Uh, we get enough moisture, soil's wet enough. Uh, we're going to get some compaction. Sometimes we need to mechanically take that out. Uh, then we also have some people that, that uh, with their yeoman plow, they're also at the same time seeding tillage radish or chicory or something with a taproot to help keep the compaction at bay once we do loosen it up. But a lot of our soils are really low in oxygen, which is limiting for our biology and our exchange of nutrients. All right, let's check in here with Eric. Uh, Eric Madsen, uh, if you want to just let us know in the chat box, where else do you want to take this tonight? What uh, what kind of questions are you are you still thinking, kicking around in the back of your mind about your system and how Carl might be able to help uh, offer some input and, and others in the audience? Where, where else do you want to take this tonight with our uh, time we have remaining?
Sounds great. I was just at a pasture walk this last week, uh, Jake Wheeler's pasture walk in central Iowa. And that was the uh, focus of the pasture walk there as well. And let's see if we can bring Carl on uh, with audio to share some thoughts about extend, extending the grazing season. Uh, are you looking at some uh, some specific uh, uh, cattle movement strategizing, Eric, or are you thinking more uh, along the line of, of species mix and, and things like that? Yeah, as you discussed earlier, you were thinking that, you know, you got to find something besides alfalfa uh, to thrive in the late summer and then something coming into early fall. Um, yeah, to how, how we can extend that season all the way through uh, into November if we can, right? I think Carl's mic might, or audio might not be working right now. Uh, I wonder if folks could uh, share some thoughts on that topic. Let's dive into extending the grazing season in the chat box. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and uh, throw in my two cents worth here. Um, when we look at the species, if we're going to, if we want to extend it later into the season, we've already talked a little bit about utilizing uh, cool season annuals, uh, but that would be in rotation. Uh, when we get into the different um, grass species, and we have tall fescue, and I'd never would want anybody to plant an endophyte infected tall fescue because of the issues with um, um, hot bellies and, and circulation issues like that. But there are some coarser tall fescues that would hold up to the snow and to the fall weather better. And Meadow fescue would would uh, come a little bit into there, which would add some quality. And then also our, having our alfalfa and red clover uh, coming in with, uh, I see about the the uh, native grasses, and they work well. Um, they're they're slower and harder to get established. Uh, big blue stem. Uh, Indian grass, uh, we're going to want to move across them uh, fairly quickly so that we don't graze them too short and get below their their uh, crown. Otherwise, uh, uh, we'll deplete or, you know, injure the stands, and we, we don't want to do that. If I was going to incorporate uh, uh, native grasses, which would be, which would be great, um, then we're really going to have to watch our summer, our spring and summer grazing, and maybe have an area set aside where we have a, a good diverse mixture of, of our native grasses. Uh, like I said, the negative to them are the uh, establishment time. Um, when we're when we're setting up our fall pastures in with the natives, I and um, some of you out there probably here online have, have uh, actually done more grazing with some of the, the warm season natives more than I have. But I think we're going to want to leave about a six inch residue. Uh, whereas with the cool season grasses going into winter, you can uh, take them shorter. I'd still like to see most of our cool season grasses and stands go, go into winter with a, a minimum height of three inches be somewhere in that three to three to five inch height and which goes into what we do this fall is going to affect it uh, for next spring uh, if you graze if you graze your pastures really short down to let's say grub it down to one or two inches it will take it longer to break dormancy in the spring and get or start getting our regrowth so if you'd like to set yourself up for for uh, next spring's grazing and not have the flush come exactly at one time, um, we could uh, leave some of our, our paddocks at uh, 
six inches, graze some down to three inches, which will which will bring them out of dormancy at different times in the spring. And I just saw Dave Hansen's coming up with the on the grass height. And that is that comes into, you know, even with the um, uh, perennial rye grass and tall fescue and orchard grass, they all like a little bit of, of uh, different grazing heights left. But unfortunately, we can't control the livestock out there to, to uh, leave them at the appropriate height. So that's why we run with about a, a three or four inch stubble going into winter. If you get it too short, uh, you don't have the carbohydrate reserves left in the roots, um, which makes them come out slower in the spring. And if we leave them too tall, we can get snow molds, at least in the northern part of the state. Um, to where we get a lot of snow, pushes it down, and then we end up with uh, getting diseases into the into the grasses. Uh, the nice thing about leaving some with a little bit of height to them is in the spring when it's on the lush grass, they're also eating some dried material, which kind of uh, uh, takes care of a little bit of that excessive protein and not enough fiber. And I don't know if I'm repeating myself on this or not, but uh, uh, setting ourselves up for extending the end of the season comes into, again, our grazing management and looking looking forward and trying to stockpile. And I can't speak for everybody, everybody here, but um, a lot of times it seems like we, we overestimate what our, our pastures will produce and we end up overstocking. And... Uh, when we start grazing, I'd rather be a little bit understocked than overstocked so that we can get a handle on, on the grasses and we don't run out of uh, pastures come August, September. At the beginning of your presentation, Eric, when you were talking about your first year, uh, how you handle your pastures, I thought that was was very good. Uh, if it's wet, we want to keep the livestock off of them. Um, uh, we don't want to damage. We don't want to damage those new seedlings. If I can graze it, I want to graze it. Uh, it'd be nice to to uh, be able to graze it about every six or so weeks the first year so that light can get, excuse me, light can get down to the crowns. Because uh, what happens is, is when you cut it or graze it down, light hits the, the crown of the plant and we send up new shoots. So that's how we start getting our density. One of the worst things we can do is, is take that first summer and not do anything with it. Um, if we even take it off for hay or baleage, that would help get sunlight down to those uh, basal nodes so that we uh, can thicken it up. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Keep the animals off of it while it's while it's wet. Uh, light grazing would would be good. And yes, I'd like to see a, a nurse crop. And whether we we graze that nurse crop or we take it off for baleage. Uh, I want to. We want to keep our weed competition down as much as we can. 
I've seen too many I've seen too many uh, new seedings fail uh, because of weed pressure. One thing to keep in mind is that that uh, grasses do not like competition as they're getting established. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, new seedings that uh, when the the weeds get up to about four feet tall, um, they take it off and then you can't find the grass and the grass was there earlier. So it comes down to trying to keep the competition sunlight down to those new seedings but keep the competition down. Nurse crops, um, uh, your oats crop is a, works well as a, as a nurse crop. Um, you could use um, triticale, any of the cool season annuals. And then once again, if you either you want to graze it off or you want to to uh, take it off as baleage, and I would suggest probably taking it off as baleage. I want to keep the rates um, as low as possible. I don't know if, if it was on yours. There you, there you are. Uh, you used oats as nurse crop at two bushel per acre, and that's as high as I would go, but that would be a good seeding rate. Some people have used winter wheat planted in the spring. Uh, winter wheat at about uh, 20, 25 pounds per acre could be grazed. It won't uh, produce a seed head because it has to vernalize. We have to go through some cold weather. So it gives us some very good quality forage and isn't um, too terribly aggressive on the, the new seeding. Some people have used Italian ryegrass, which would be a very high quality forage. Um, but I would not put down more than three or four pounds of that as a nurse crop because it can be so aggressive that it can smother out your new seedings. The purpose for the nurse crop is to hold down the weed competition, uh, still give us some, some uh, quality forage either to graze off or uh, take off as, as a, a, for winter feed. Seems like if we don't put a, down a nurse crop in the spring with a spring seeding that um, Weeds such as lamb's quarter, uh, pigweed, um, get up and get going, and they're more competitive than the nurse crop would be on the new new seeding. So it's best if we have a uh, nurse crop with it. Uh, question is, have I used uh, foliar sprays for pastures? And the answer is yes. We we're fortunate that that. Uh, our soils are really pretty biologically active now. I didn't see a lot of a lot of response with it. Uh, generally, use the foliar sprays to enhance either production or also raise bricks bricks levels or sugar levels up in the plant. Uh, the fish, besides being smelly, uh, gives us some uh, uh, phosphorus and biological stimulation. Uh, molasses is uh, a good carbon source that that uh, feeds uh, bacteria in the soil. And what we're doing with the whole thing, when I was talking earlier about the poor pastures and balancing your soils, the whole reasoning behind that is, is not trying to get um, the soil test to show that you have so much phosphorus or so much potassium. What we're trying to do is stimulate biology. And 
what you're showing there for uh, foliar sprays would stimulate biology. Uh, but if we don't have air in the soil form to thrive, then uh, we'll be spraying every time we go through and graze. And I would just assume uh, first, first things that I think we need to do is, besides test our soils, is also take a penetrometer, a tool out there to see how much compaction we have and uh, loosen that up and get air in the soil. I've seen more pastures respond just by running an airway or a yeoman plow through them uh, actually in plant vigor, plant productivity, and quality. We've got about five minutes left, folks, so I wondered if we could uh, take these remaining questions and if you have one or two more from the audience to put those questions in the chat box now, and we'll try to bring Carl back in on audio to address them. Carl, can you hear us? Luke? Very good. Yes, go ahead, Carl. Yeah, I was just wondering. I, I lost it again. I was wondering if I was back on. Yep, go ahead. Why don't you take take on these last few questions, and we'll conclude in another couple minutes. Okay. Um, Eric asked about the, any other tools to increase the aeration other than the airway or the ripper. Um, I wished I was able to get the picture of that yeoman plow up. It looks like a little mini deep ripper, but it takes a lot less uh, horsepower than the airway. And I'm up for any any tool that will work as long as we don't disturb the top, and we're breaking up um, we're breaking up the compaction zone in between in between the um, uh, shanks. And your yeoman plows are about on. I think they're on about 20 or 22 inch uh, shanks. Um, so those are probably our only two. And the other tool is once we get that compaction broke, broken up, would be to have uh, some of the deep tap rooted plants. And that's when uh, uh, some of our tillage radish and some of those kind of things can do. Uh, the claims on the microbial sprays uh, that will aerate the soil. I've seen a lot of things that, that work, but most of the time, until we have the biological activity going on in the soil, we get our soils not in a perfect balance, but at least get decent amounts of potassium and phosphorus and, and calcium in the soils. A lot of times the microbial sprays don't last. And if we have to spray between every grazing or every cutting uh, with with biology, um, then maybe something's wrong with the soil. There's a picture of the 
of the uh, yeoman plow. Uh, a lot of times they'll have a basket on behind them uh, to kind of level it back out. But you can see that's not that's not going to kill out everything in between those shanks, but it will get air back into those soils and let the the biology work. And Dave's comment about the taprooted plants, absolutely. And our whole the whole thing we want to do is is have the earthworms working for us, increase our humus, our organic matter, um, and build our fertility. And then um, the question on the resource for uh, grazing values for native or volunteer grasses and plants. Uh, if you're looking at, at forage values, yeah, the there are some resources out there. And if uh, Luke and I want to go back on an email here tomorrow, uh, we can I can uh, look up some of the the stuff that we use to look up the values. I'll be sure to link to those uh, those resources on the Farminar webpage. So I'll just link it right underneath the uh, recording uh, link of this Farminar. And so yeah, we'll make sure to have that available uh, at practicalfarmers.org slash Farminar. Folks, it is now 8.30 on my watch. And so I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Carl and Eric, for presenting tonight to us on this topic. I thought it was, uh, despite the, the lemons we were given by nature and by the website, uh, the internet, we like we made some good lemonade out of it. I hope so. I hope it was worth it. So join us next week. We're bringing on another uh, wonderful, exciting speaker to uh, share with you for 90 minutes with farmers as the speakers, farmers as the experts on practicalfarmers.org uh, slash farm and R. You can check out more. We've got more coming up in winter, and we are very grateful to have you as our guests, and we'll, we'll see you again real soon online.